Hello and welcome to podcast number 19 from the Self-Publishing Formula. Two writers, one just starting out, the other a bestseller. Join James Blatch and Mark Dawson and their amazing guests as they discuss how you can make a living telling stories. There's never been a better time to be a writer. Hello and welcome to part two of three of our mini-series on non-fiction and how to create a revenue stream from your non-fiction ideas. So I guess we're, who are we aiming this at, Mark? What sort of non-fiction people are we talking about? I think anybody with um, any kind of knowledge or expertise that they think would be useful to other people. Anyone can can look at, um, on, the, on the one hand, writing a non-fiction book. That's still a, a perfectly a viable way of de- delivering that knowledge. But on the other hand, um, you know, we're looking at a, a billion dollar business uh, industry now in terms of building courses um, and selling those courses to people as a way for them to accelerate their learning. Yeah, online courses are a huge area. And it, for obvious reasons, in a way, it's a really convenient, attractive way of self-improving, basically. You know, the old days, you would have had to pay a consultant for one-on-one training, which is prohibitively expensive and quite difficult to arrange. Or you go to seminars, real live people uh, in a room somewhere in a, you know, in a nearby city. And again, that's uh, expensive all round. But online learning, where you get incredibly detailed tuition many hours of it and you can watch it and absorb it in your own time you can watch it several times and you can really become an expert in an area and an expert in an area that's ultimately going to well depending on what you're trying to do it for but could easily turn into something that's going to make you money or possibly change your life change your career and so on it doesn't suit absolutely everything i was thinking the other day about the big self-improving areas like becoming a doctor and a pilot i guess you still have to go to a hospital and in a get in a plane at some point but there's lots of other areas and i suppose if you for instance you're a day trader i think that would be a really good area if you've got an expertise in day trading i think doing an online course and telling people how to set themselves up into that area or maybe financial advising or you know there are so there's a myriad of ideas our guest today is somebody who understands the mechanics and also the marketing process necessary to turn that idea into a revenue reality for you. And he was an inspiration for us. He was was one of the go-to guys for the self-publishing formula when we started our germ of an idea, wasn't he, Mark? He was. So he originally taught Nick um, when Nick did his uh, 10K Readers course. And um, he Nick then recommended David to me. And I had a look at... um, David's course is called Create Awesome Online Courses, which um, I'm always a little bit leery of, of, of the word awesome, but it suits David like a glove. You'll, you'll hear when, when he starts talking. He's totally awesome. Yeah, he put this course together. Nick raved about it. I looked at it. I thought it was interesting. We we spent $1,000 on it about um, a year ago, and it really did provide us with a really, really useful template that I followed quite carefully um, when I set up the first iteration of our Facebook ads course is really good for thinking about what you might be able to teach, how to prove ideas, how to set things up technically, how to do it, then how to advertise it, how to handle finding customers, customer care. It really covers everything. Um, and there are other courses available on the market, but I would say David's is one of the best and he's been doing it for a long time too. So he's extremely experienced and we're going to get loads and loads out, out of this interview with him. Okay, David Seitman Garland is a guru for mediapreneurs, which is a term, by the way, that he came up with. His site, The Rise to the Top, is a goldmine of instructional detail and motivational tips on how to sell digital products and programs online. Now, here at the SPF, we know that his stuff works because David is the guy that we went to when we launched our Facebook Ads for Authors course, which in a bit of a journey has brought us to this point, David, where we now have you as a guest on our podcast. And uh, I'm pretty happy that you were there right at the beginning for us. Oh, there we go. It goes uh, in full circle. So I'm excited to be here. Thanks for having me. Is this a Star Wars moment where the student... No, no, we haven't, haven't got, exactly, to, yeah, exactly. we haven't got it's there. Some, it's some kind of moment. It's some yeah. kind of moment. You're, yeah. We're still the Padawans, I think. So, okay, David, look, this is um, part of a mini series within our podcast that we're doing about revenue generation from 
factual in your area factual it's not necessarily using the book as a revenue generator it's using the book as right. a lead generator right right so tell, tell us a little bit about the approach that people who i don't know whether it's let's say they've got they've got a book on windsurfing you know what is their approach to revenue generation yeah i mean so you know and it was funny because for me in 2010 which was before i kind of mastered this i actually wrote a a published book and the funny thing was i just had no clue what i was doing like many like many you know first time authors where you're not sure where the revenue is coming from is it the book is it the, is it something from the book and really at the end of the day for the most part the most successful authors that are have been students and customers of mine really it, it turns into one of two things and it's all about an online course right so it's all about creating an online course and teaching your expertise and what i've noticed is that it goes two different ways so in the example you just said what was what windsurfing yeah yeah i just made that up so let's say someone is is a windsurfing writes a windsurfing book well a logical lead in for that is that someone can take your step by step windsurfing course to learn how to, you know, windsurf in the deepest and windiest of seas in less than 30 days, right? And the thing is, it just adds up a new level when you're an author. It says, okay, here's my book. That's kind of like an entry point. And some people even call it a business card in some cases, right? Even though we know it's much more than that. And then people that really want advanced handheld training to get a result can then purchase your course. And and that's a great way of kind of looking at it. Now, on the other hand too, and we were talking about this actually via email, it's a lot of folks that are listening to this and follow you guys are also um, fictional authors. Is that, is that a fair thing to say as well? Yeah, absolutely. And not unlike Mr. Mr. Dawson, right? And so what you also have to think of is you might be thinking, well, I'm not teaching something specific, right? Like I'm not doing a how to book or a business book or, or something like that is a course an option for me. And I would say, yes, it's exactly what you guys did, you know, in many cases with authors. So there's a big industry of people teaching what they've done out there online. So great example with you guys, Mark's got these great books, right? They're thrillers. And he didn't teach people necessarily how to write thrillers or something like that. He created a course on Facebook ads for authors. So you might have a skill set right now. Maybe your skill set is writing funny stories and you can teach people how to do that or, or something that might be different than your actual audience for your books. And that's okay as well. So there's two different ways of looking at it. Yeah. So Mark is in exactly that position where he does have two different audiences. And I think before we get on to some of the strategies and tips, and I, I want to talk to you about pricing and that sort of thing. We should say that you do have to be able to give something. It has to be an area of expertise, but you shouldn't underestimate that most people, if you're turning out books, there are areas of expertise. And in Mark's case, he knew he had the social media advertising stuff cracked. He could see it in black and white, a supersonic uh, a boost to his his life. And that would, therefore was something that he could then turn into a course and, and an instruction. But other people, for them, like you say, it could be story structure. Or, mm-hmm. you know, there's exactly. something, there's, there's got to be something, isn't there? Yeah, I heard one yesterday. Actually, someone brought up an idea on a training I was doing of doing a course centered around how to come up with like the perfect character for a fictional book. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Mm. So like, there's a lot of different opportunities there. And I think a good way to look at it, you know, where people, people are thinking to themselves, you know, I'm not an expert. That's a classic thing I hear all the time. You know, I'm not, you know, I, I don't know. I don't know. I'm not an expert. And, and the bottom line is the expert fairy doesn't come flying in the window. Do you know what I mean? In the yeah. middle of the night yeah. and just one day you wake up and you're an expert. So the way I like to look at it for people is a lot of times the topic's right under your nose. So what is something that you've gotten results from that you can help other people get results, right? And so we've had thousands and thousands of successful students of mine with their online courses. Some folks are just starting from a point of, you know, I'll just make up an example of, you know what, I taught myself how to play clarinet over the age of 40. This is an actual course that we <laughs> that right. had, that's from a customer of mine. And now she has a course teaching other adults how to play clarinet, right? She doesn't have, you know, 50 degrees and clarinet playing, or I don't yeah. know, you know, whatever those might be out there. But bottom line is if you've gotten yourself results and or results, you know, with other people in some form or fashion, 
then you're qualified to teach us. And I think that's, that's one of the key things to keep in mind because that really does hold people back is they wait and wait and wait and wait. And, and there really are lots of opportunities right now to hone in on a specific skill and something you can teach. Yeah. So in many cases, the, the person who's ahead is the person who's decided to take the step. It's not, exactly. N- nothing exactly. magic about that. Their knowledge. And actually, for a lot of our uh, people listening to the podcast, this, their area of expertise, something they can leverage in this, er- in this way, may not be their writing it may be their day job actually you know they may yeah, they may sure have, i mean i've often thought um day trading would be i don't know how much day trading courses are out there but that's got to be a fantastic right. area uh, i keep looking for the perfect day trader who's quite charismatic we can do an online course together because it's my secret plan to become a gazillionaire but yes yeah, there some, you go something like that i'm coming to you of course david for the tips when that happens but so people fall into two categories right category one are people that know exactly what they want to create their course on. And if so, that's great. There's some great ways you can hone in on that and verify that and make sure there's a market for it. That's awesome. But then there's also category number two of people that are sitting there saying, well, I'm not 100% sure it could be this or that, or maybe I don't know at all. And actually, when I was getting started, I was more in category number two. I did a podcast for five years. I had all these different interviews and I just wasn't sure what I was going to create a course on. And a big tip for people is to look in in your life and and think about what are some things you've accomplished. If you go to a party or on social media or whatever it might be, and someone asks you questions, what are they asking you questions about? Are they asking for, you know, tips on, I don't know, how did you lose the weight or how did you get the book published or, you know, whatever those questions might be. A lot of times the topics are right under your nose and you don't even know it until you start to look for it. And one of the key things that I would encourage people to really think about is what is something that you can teach that you've done that's results oriented. That's the big thing, right? Mm-hmm. So if you, if, if you close your eyes and you picture someone goes through your course and they do everything you say, because they're just a rock star of following, right? <laughs> what would be the result? What would be the result? And that's one of the key things to think about is making sure that there's a concrete result of taking your course as you kind of think of putting this together. So it's got to be a measurable thing. Exactly. And it might not be like literally something like, oh, they made $10,000 or anything sketchy like that, that you would never want to promise. Case in point, you know, you're an author and now you're going to be driving leads, you know, via Facebook with the face with Mark's Facebook ads course. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Or with my course, it's of course to create a course and launch it. So you want to have a scenario that if they follow what you're saying, this is what's going to happen or this is going to be the result. Okay. And an important step that I know you spoke to us about quite early on is to understand what your audience wants as well. So it's not just an assumption at the beginning that what you've got to say is what they want. And that's very important. And there's definitely some some tips on doing that. And what I like to do is good old fashioned surveys, nothing fancy, nothing crazy. I mean, you can use any kind of survey software out there. Um, I use something called Wufu, W-U-F-O-O, but SurveyMonkey, whatever it might be. And I simply ask people, what do you want to know more about blank? And blank is the topic that you're thinking about for your online course. So what do you want to know more about horseback riding? What do you want to know more about day trading with less than $10,000 or you know, whatever it might be? And you don't mention a course. You don't need to mention anything. You're just getting some feedback. And then you use whatever assets that you have to get that survey out. So it might be you have an email list, you might have a blog, you might have a podcast. You know, if you're just getting started, maybe you just have a a personal Facebook page or something like that. And that is some great market research that you can do absolutely free to start to get feedback, to start to get ideas. And also the survey is very much a confidence builder. And you'll notice that if you do this is that you'll start to realize, oh my God, I know a lot more than I think I do on this topic. I remember when I sent out my first survey and this was about doing interviews. My first course was about doing online interviews because I'd done 500 of them plus and and people were always asking me, how do you get guests? How do you do this? How do you do that? I remember I was getting the questions back because I was kind of in that, well, do I know enough phase, right? And I was like, oh my God, I can't believe people are asking this. Of course I know the answers to this. And so it's a big confidence builder and kind of testing of the market as well. Another way of thinking about it is, uh, A, you're absolutely right. You probably know a lot more about the subject than you think you do. And the internet is an incredibly enabling thing. 
Okay, so there are people whose lives can be changed because they can take your course and make some big decisions in their lives. And that's yeah. not something to be embarrassed about or scared about, right? That's something that's that's a way I mean, you're going to make money, hopefully from it if you get things right. But think about in terms of using the internet to its best advantage for people. I couldn't agree with you more. And at the end of the day, right, what this really is about is it's a results oriented business. You know, when you do online courses and you have to come from the place of wanting to help people, you want to have people help results. You want to be like, I mean, it sounds almost cliche, but you want to be changing people's lives one way or another, whether it's saving them time or money or teaching them a new skill. Those are the most successful courses out there as the people that are driven by that mission to want to help people. Of course, it's going to make great money and great freedom and all these great things in your business, but it has to come from a place of wanting to help people. And it's not just about courses on making money or something like that. Helping people is such a wide spectrum of different things that you can do, whether it's helping people have better dates or get more dates or how to get your baby to sleep. I can tell you right now, that's an invaluable one that we have. (laughs) That's a bit of voodoo. Right. With a little daughter that I have right now, I, I, I can understand that one for sure. So there's always ways to be thinking about that. And when you come from that place of wanting to help people, that's where the people that have longevity in this business and also people that have the most passionate customers that get results. The idea then of getting started, we've got, we do have quite a few authors who have this nonfiction and some quite often it's things like cookery and stuff. And I had a long conversation the other night with somebody who's moving into the cookery sphere and I spoke, spoke a lot to them. And this, I think, goes to people who are, it's not so niche, their area, it's quite broad, that it is quite important at an early stage to hone down what it is that they do that's different and, and where their particular expertise are. What, you know, I guess in business you call you USP. That's something else I think you need to sort out quite early on in the process. My, my saying is that specific sells and more specific sells even more at a higher price right? And so the thing to keep in mind is the more specific you can go with your course, the better. And and this is one of the key mistakes that I see is people going way too broad. You know, you want to solve a specific problem or help with a, a specific ambition, okay? I'll use a couple of examples and just show you how you can hone down. So you can hone down two different ways and you can do both as well. It's either by topic or for audience, okay? So a great example of one for audience would actually be Mark's course. Let's just use that as an example, right? So Facebook ads for authors, okay? So it's not just Facebook ads. It's not just ads. It's not just ads for everybody. It's Facebook ads for authors, okay? So now let's say you're interested in Facebook ads and you've got two courses in front of you. One is just a general course on Facebook ads and the other one is Facebook ads for authors and you're an author, which one are you going to go with, right? So one of the big ways that people can compete with big competitors in online courses and things like that is becoming much more specific when it comes to either the audience you serve or the topic that you do, right? That's kind of an interesting way of looking at it because you really want to be clear on who it's going to be for. And I think that's one of the big mistakes that I see all the time when it comes to courses. I guess, ideally, both of those would be quite specific, a specific audience and a specific thing to do with them. Right, exactly. Like, I like to look at it as kind of a laser cut situation, right? Let's say you're doing another, since we're on the topic of authors, right? Let's say you're doing a course on how to write a book, okay? Of course, there's plenty of courses on that, right? So let's say you're thinking to yourself, well, how do I stick out from the pack? Well, a couple of different things. One, when there's other courses on your subject, that's a great thing. It's, it's more of a red flag if there's not courses on your subject. Does that right. make sense? Yeah. Because it's showing that there's a market out there. There's always ways to stick out because no one has your personality. No one has the way that you're going to do it. So what I always get more concerned about is people saying, well, there's no other courses on my topic and no one else is selling to my audience. Well, that's like I'm throwing red flags all over the place if I hear something like that. You know what I'm saying? Because there's always ways to stick out. And one of my favorite ones is to get even more specific. So let's just say, case in point, what I just said, there's one, let's say you're you're thinking about doing a course on how to write a book, which I think is a very kind of, I don't want to say typical, but a common course idea that people have that are authors, right? Okay. And that's great. I'm not blasting that, 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 that actually is a great topic, but you could go far more niche with that. And you could just say, for example, you could do a course on just how to write a proper proposal 
if you want to get a traditional publisher to say yes. Hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. Like, like going all the way down to a specific need or just how to write the actual book, the outlines, the tips and things like that. So you don't need to bite off more than you can chew. The more specific you get, the better. And that's how I see a lot of my customers compete with really, really big competitors that have been around for like forever is they get more specific and there's riches and niches. I guess you think to the bits that would have helped you and that's you know what would what would appeal to you because if it's as you say that broad title how to write a book you're probably not going to buy that if it's how to write a police thriller you know a very specific yeah, area right. that's sunny, that's, you, that's awesome yeah, that's so, a great yeah we should do that one yeah so you're thinking straight away god i wish i'd had that course when i when i set out would have made life easier hey bingo right. i can do right. it and that makes it that makes a great point too is that I don't know if you've ever heard this one. This is kind of a cliche term in business sometimes where people are like, I am not my customer or you are not your customer. And what I've actually found with courses is actually the opposite is very much true. In many cases, the customer is sort of you, maybe even you a few years ago. Does that make sense? Yeah. I think that dovetails with the way good authors think is basically they write the books that they would like to read. Exactly. Because a lot of times I find myself And I I find my customers a lot of times when they're writing copy for their courses saying, God, I wish I had this when I was getting started, just like we just said a couple of minutes ago. And and that's one of the key things. It's a very powerful thing. So think back when you were getting started, what was something you wish you had, like a really specific course that was on that you would have been like, oh my God, that would have accelerated my growth or that would have saved me time or that would have saved me money big time. That's another great way of looking at it. Let's talk about mailing lists a little bit then. So I mean, it's a common thread with people selling books and uh, and having a space online. And I know that uh, it's, it's absolutely central as well uh, in your world. You know, the truth of the matter is that's the life of this business is your email list and your relationship with that email list. So in terms of building your email list for somebody who's starting out with maybe they've got their books selling their fiction books in that instance. So they've got a basically a blank sheet of paper for the other side of the business that they've got the idea from, from listening to sure. this interview, hopefully. Yep. Where do they even begin, David? Yeah, great question. And let me just also specify something that, that's important, is that people debate this all the time. You know, Is there a magic number that needs to be on your email list to uh, have a successful online course? And the answer is really no, because I've seen everything across the board. When I first launched my first course, which was Create Awesome Interviews, there were just 400 people on the email list for that course, just 400 people. And it did $19,800 in sales. Wow. And, and to now that, that course grew and grew and grew, grew and grew and grew because when there, where there's one, there's more. So don't think that you have to build an email list necessarily of 50,000 people before you launch something. I think that's one of the key things to keep in mind before you even talk about list building because too many people wait too long. Is the size of the list important? Yes, but also you want to kind of move forward with it so you can get it out there and get more and more customers over time. Make sense? Yeah, it does. And uh, is that to do with pricing as well? Yeah, it does, but really it starts with a list. And, and, and in, you know, we could talk pricing for sure, but I want to give some, some list tips because sure. I think that's important that you just talked about. So the mistake that happens with email lists is that people don't have people opt in for something specific. So meaning it just says, join my email list and then I'll sell you some stuff, right? Or join the list and you'll get nothing, but at some point I'll give you something, right? So the, the, instead what you want to do, and this is all about getting your house in order before you get traffic, because traffic is actually easier than you think. This is the part that, that's very important where people miss, is that you want to have people opt in which means, you know, enter your email address for something free. Okay. So we call these opt-in pages. We call these lead pages. We call these landing pages. We call these squeeze pages. There's a million different terms for them. I personally use something called lead pages, but you can use anything you want. doesn't matter. And what the goal of this page is, is quite simple. It's to give away something free in return for their email address. They get something free, you get their email address, and then later on, you're going to bring them down a path towards a sale uh, with free content and then doing a launch and all that kind of good stuff, right? So on this page, you want to give away something free. So there's plenty of examples. Let's choose a random topic and we can come up with something. I always like a random topic that I know nothing about. So I'll let you choose anything you want and we'll come up with something. Snowboarding. Okay, snowboarding. You could start out with an opt-in page that gives away a free video 
on snowboard trick tips, something like that. So they enter their email, they get a free video where you're going to go through some tips. Okay. Another thing you could do is a snowboarding buyer's guide or something like that, where you go through all the cool equipment they have to look. So they enter their email address, they get a PDF with something like that, like a buyer's guide or something like that. Another thing you could do would be like a cheat sheet. So some tips on pulling off your first trick, things like that. You get the idea there. These are called lead magnets, right? So lead magnets are things that people opt in for. They get them free. Okay. Personally, I love things that are video related because they have a higher perceived value. So one of the things that I teach and one of the things I love is creating a free video series for people. So in the snowboarding example, maybe you give them three free videos where they learn a trick in each video, right? And so they opt in, they get the first video, a couple of days later, they get a second video, a couple of days later, they get a third video, whatever it might be. So the best thing to start, and I want to give you the full scope there, is really with one, right? Just start with one as you get started, something that your audience would find valuable as your first opt-in page. And what your job then becomes, I'm putting that in air quotes, job, Mm -hmm. right? Is to drive as many as the proper people to that page as you possibly can. Because the reason is that you will build a targeted email list, which is much better than just shooting a bullhorn out there, shooting a shotgun out there, getting a bunch of random people, and then trying to figure out what they're really into. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Because now you're real specific. You know if they opted in for the snowboarding thing, they're interested in snowboarding. That's that's very obvious, right? So then it becomes, how do you get traffic to your page? And really, it comes down to a few different things. Number one, it's time versus money, right? There's always options, one or the other. Do you have a lot of money? Do you have a lot of time? Do you have both? Uh, whatever it might be. So if you've got a little bit more money than time, Facebook ads are a great way to get started with this. I mean, are not. You know, you can do that and you can scale that up very quickly to start to build that relationship with people, getting them clicked in on ads and getting them ready to go. It's also the most scalable. Some other great ways is optimizing your website everywhere, by the way. So if you do blog posts, podcasts, anything like that, make sure that you mention your giveaway all the time. You know what I mean? Below it, put it all over your site, make sure that it's ready to go. So if people are coming in, let's say you have this great blog post you write at the bottom, remind them that they can get their snowboarding cheat sheet or remind them that they can get their snowboarding video. That's one of the key things as well is your own content, right? And then out there promoting that. Another great way is interviews. So once you have a specific topic narrowed down, so let's just use snowboarding. Let's say that you have this really cool trick that no one else can, I'm making this up, but you know, no one else can learn that, well, hopefully someone can learn it. And you can teach them it in 30 days or less. I don't know that they're gonna be able to do a backflip in 30 days or less on the snowboarding. Okay. That's going to be your big topic. Well, that's a great topic now to go out to podcasts, blogs, things like that, and send emails and say, listen, I've got this great method for teaching a backflip and snowboarding. I'd love to come on, teach your audience a little bit about it. Does that sound good? And then anytime you do an interview or anything like that, you're going to get a link back to your website. And that's where you use the lead page or the opt-in page. That's one of the key things you want to make sure when you're driving traffic, all the traffic goes there. So there's a lot more tips to that, but that's kind of a five or six minute crash course um, in generating opt-ins. Yeah, that's great, David. And uh, uh, one point I want to make about this, I think that uh, when you're thinking about what it is you're going to give away... Our view at SPF, and we came to this quite early, and probably I'm sure influenced by you, was that it had to be something of standalone value, something that was was really good and and that we should be, it's going to sound a bit perverse, we should be happy when someone does that, then doesn't buy our course, but gets value out of it and improves themselves. Because that means, because you've got to be doing this to make people better. And if you're getting it right at that stage, you know, don't worry about the other stuff. It will it will follow because of that value. So I would say don't just give away a few pages, a PDF handout. Give away something that's really going to show how amazing you, know, it, it, you are and the rest will be a lot easier for you after that. So it should be of value. Yeah, I, I 1,000% agree with that because at the end of the day, you know, not everyone's going to buy and that's totally fine. And you want to be known as the person that has great, valuable stuff. So they come back again, you know, and I think that that's one of the key things. Also, you know, webinars are a big thing in this business and I love doing webinars and and they're great, but that's one of the key things when you create very valuable free webinars for people, 
regardless of whether they purchase or not at the end, let's just say they come on and they, they soak up your valuable content. You want to be known for that. You want to be known that you're giving away great stuff as well. And what ends up happening is people think to themselves, and this is the funny thing. Some people think, well, I'm scared to give away so many great things because then nobody's going to buy. You heard that one before? Yeah. Yep. And guess what? It is straight up not true. It is a myth, 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 myth. Because here's what ends up happening. It's actually the opposite effect. So what happens is people say, and I've done this too, and I've purchased things, and, and maybe you have as well. I think, oh my God, if the free stuff was so good, <laughs> that good, I can't wait to have my mind explode when I buy the, the, the paid stuff, right? <laughs> That's where you want to be at. You don't want to be the person that gives out the crappy little thing. And then they're like, well, I don't know. Who cares? This kind of sucks. I'm not opting in for anything again. So that, it's a very good point, And I totally agree with it. Great. Okay. Let's move on to one or two other areas just before I know you've got a dash uh, uh, shortly. So we mentioned price. And I was thinking immediately when you talked about uh, list sizing, about that sort of conversion of the people who are going to buy your paid product and how you price your your course and what sort of conversion rate you should expect or should be aiming for? Is there such a thing? I was actually talking about this the other day. I was I was doing a uh, CrossFit fitness competition, and what they do is they put out the workouts on a certain day of the week, and then you do them, and you can then redo them, and then you can redo them as many times as possible or as many times as you can stand between Thursday and Monday, and then you get your score. In, okay, and a lot of people will redo it and do better and redo it and do better, but they don't really know what to aim for on the first workout. They don't know what's a good time. They don't know what's a bad time. They don't know until you do it. And it's the same thing when it comes to conversion rate for online courses. You really don't know what a quote unquote good conversion rate is until you actually launch your first time. Then you have something to compare it against, right? So I'm a big believer in creating your own data, not just going by a random trend that we kind of pull out of the industry because everybody's different. Everybody's built their list differently. Everyone's been in this business for a different period of time. Everyone has a different reputation, different credibility. There's so many different factors that go into conversion rates that it wouldn't be fair to say to someone, you know what, you better have a 3% conversion rate or that's a failure because at the end of the day, it's not true. So I'm a big believer in creating your own data just like you would for a workout like that that's measured when it comes to conversion rate, okay? And, I, and you know what's even funny? We've sold, I don't know, probably in the last few years, over at least over $5 million in, in, in digital products and programs. And I couldn't even tell you my exact conversion rate. I could tell you exact conversion rates on each campaign we do, but I, I can't even give you an overall one. You know yeah. what I'm saying? And even, so with, even within your sphere, those conversion rates may vary. Drastic. Yeah, because Drastic. of different markets and... Exactly. And also list size, right? So as the bigger you, your list gets, the smaller your conversion rate's going to be, but you're going to get more customers. Do you know what I'm saying? So there, there's a lot of variance there when it comes to a conversion rate. That being said, on pricing, which, which is an interesting, huge topic in itself that I could talk about for 100 hours, but I'll just give you a couple quick things on that. Number one, I'm a huge, big, big believer in premium pricing for online courses because there's so many other crappy things out there that have lower prices. Online courses, when you position them correctly, are premium. And it's great because when you're helping people get results, a specific type of audience, I would always encourage people to be in the top 5 to 10% of their market when it comes to their price for their course. Because here's the thing, it doesn't take a million people to make a living at this. And I think that's one of the important things. Uh, a mentor of mine named Ryan Lee pointed this out very early on when I was getting going with online courses. He said, listen, David, he said, it's going to be the same amount of work for you to do a $97 course as it is for a $997 course. So why would you not do that and create something extremely valuable for people where you can also obviously generate more revenue, but what also ends up happening, and this is key, you get more serious customers. That's the key part of this. Yeah. You get more serious customers that are willing to invest in themselves and get results, right? There was a customer of mine named Karen Paddock. She's got a uh, course on productivity, time management, right? She increased her price big time and had less people sign up, but ended up with 33% more revenue and over 50% more testimonials. Because now people are thinking to themselves, well, you know what? This is a significant investment. 
I'm actually going to follow through with this. And that's one of the key things to keep in mind with this. This is, again, the results business. So your pricing has to be an investment for folks that you want. You want the serious folks. That's that's at the end of the day. And I know Mark's done that. And I'm sure you guys have seen that behind the scenes, that pricing can make a big difference with that as opposed to going after $2 and $5 and $7 people. Yeah, that's great. Uh, the final area that I want to talk to you about is the ongoing engagement with your customers. You know, it shouldn't just all be front loaded, right? To build your list up, make a sale and yeah. then move on. Uh, right. To, to do it right, it's got to be a community that goes on, I think. Yeah, and there's a lot of different ways to do that. I'm a big believer in keeping it simple when it comes to this. Yeah, you don't want to just sell people, then you know you ride off on a on a bicycle um, into the. I don't know why you'd be on a bicycle, but you know, in this scenario, you're on a bicycle. Or you're windsurfer, or you're snowboard. Yeah, 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 or one or the other. You're on some kind of mode of transportation. But the thing is, what I like to do, number one, and there's pros and cons of this, but we have a very, very vibrant Facebook community for us, and a lot of people find a lot of value in doing that with their online courses. So that becomes its own. People are making connections. Some people meet up in different cities. Like that becomes its own little universe of community, which is a key thing that can be built over time with your course. And and realize your Facebook group is going to start with just a few people, but it builds up over time. I remember for my main course, my, my group started with just, you know, 50, 60 people. And now it's in the thousands you know, when it comes to that. So community is a big aspect that you can have there. The other thing is content. So where people get confused here and there's not a perfect formula for it is how much content do I need to be sending people, right? And the way that I like to look at it, I really don't send out all that much content all the time. You know, I invite people to webinars. I got to different things. We, we, I send out tips. But one of the greatest tips that I had on content was from a guy named Russell Brunson. And his tip was that he sends out these emails frequently that he calls Seinfeld emails. They're really emails about nothing, okay? (laughs) Like the show. But really, it's just sharing stories or quick tips or things like that. Just just little stuff that keeps people engaged, a piece of advice, a case study, or things like that. But for me now, I don't necessarily send out content on a necessarily a regular basis. However, I've been in this business for a long time. And I know for your first several years let's just call it three, at least, I would recommend being pretty consistent with the day of the week. So have it where it's wacky Wednesdays and every Wednesday you're going to send something to someone. Do you know what I mean? Send something to your customers. It might be a, hello, here's a funny photo of my dog. It might be, hello, here's a great tip. Here's a great case study, something like that. And that's a great way to build some consistency. And then as your business evolves, you can obviously get a little more Uh, loosey-goosey with it, but we find that we're always looking for valuable things to send to our customers, both free and paid. That's great, David. I'm I'm aware of the time and the line's just starting to drop out. So uh, I guess the St. Louis or the Huntingdon, either one of them, uh, the broadband's just getting a little bit damp. It's an art and a science, I think, and you've you've mastered the science. And but I love the way that you talk about the approach and the tone uh, of the business and how that should be, because that's for me a very important part of it. And just remind us again: Did you say you think you've you've turned over five million dollars in this? Yeah, yeah. So we've done last year was over two and a half. Wow. So that was great. Um, and now, yes, in, in the gamut of it, we're actually well over that now, which is great. But what I'm more excited about than that, obviously, it's pretty exciting. Let's not, let's yeah. <laughs> not going to lie. <laughs> uh, not going to lie, it's pretty exciting, is we have had hundreds and hundreds of students with just amazing stories and case studies. And that, that's really what keeps me going personally. And I'm not talking about just people that have made seven figures. And by the way, we've had several students doing seven figures, many, many doing multiple six, many doing six and five and and list goes down. But I get equally excited about people telling me about their very first sale, their very first sale to their, you know, they, they woke up, they checked the phone, they rolled over in the bed and they saw like a receipt in their email box and they like jumped up and down and did a little backflip. You know, that's the stuff that gets me excited because where there's one, there's more. And it's the confidence building and the, the, the ability to say, oh my God, I created something from my brain that other people are now purchasing. And so that's what I get excited about is hearing people that launch their first course do 2,000, 5,000, 10,000. And then several years later, we've had plenty of those people that are now doing several hundred thousand, if not into seven figures. And that, that's what I think is very exciting about this business is the long-term potential for people. 
Yeah. Well, anyone who's uh, sold a single book will know that feeling, David. Amen. Uh, yeah, yeah. Brilliant. Thank you so much indeed for joining us. It's been a delight to talk to you, David. And uh, I'm sure uh, that we will talk again as time goes on and we'll keep a close eye on... Uh, Oh, yeah, we should say where people to go to, to learn more about yourself, rise to the top.com. Yeah, you can go to the rise to the top.com and also um, create awesome online courses.com. So if you're either way, we'll lead you some way, shape, or form that way. And I uh, would love to see you over there. And let, and let me know also if, if you hear from me that you heard about us on this uh, podcast for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Great, David. We're going to let you go. Thank you so much. All right. I appreciate it. So David, Simon Garland. I think there are quite a few David Garlands on the internet, so hence there's uh, Simon uh, in the middle of that. But like a few of the people we've spoken to, when you hear him and you hear his enthusiasm and his attention to detail, it's easy to see why he thrives in this area, in this self-starting, self-improving area. But a um, uh, very, very valuable set of information and a clear direction for people who've got a non-fiction idea and uh, are looking to I was going to say revenueize it because I'm just going to basically make that word up, but um, turn it into something that they can pay the wages. Monetize. Monetize. There you go. I mean, it, that is just a made up word that's been used more often. So it's starting to sound like a real word. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. But good guy. Yeah. Very good guy. He knows he knows his onions, as, as we say over here. Definitely someone that people can learn a lot, a lot from. So I hope that was an interesting interview. Yeah, uh, definitely was for us. We have one final part in this mini series uh, on nonfiction, and that's with Anka Nagpal. Anka is a founder of Teachable, one of the founders. They've been hugely successful in this area. They provide a platform that we we rate, we use it, we find it very smooth. It gives us uh, least amount of hassle, and it presents the course in a really nice way. And they've got, I mean, if you you they go to TechCrunch, I think initially for their their funding, their their you know one of the big uh, tech startup funding uh, contests. They won a couple of million dollars there. I think they got another couple of million dollars just a few weeks ago this year. And it just goes to show this area is a very, very hot area at the moment. And Anchor is a, an interesting guy. So he's next week. That'll be the final part of it. And uh, I don't know what we're doing the week after, but if you're a novelist and you have absolutely no intention ever of doing anything in the non-fiction realm, Podcast 21 will be back to fiction. We can promise you that. You've been listening to the Self-Publishing Formula Podcast. Visit us at selfpublishingformula.com for more information, show notes, and links on today's topics. You can also sign up for our free video series on using Facebook ads to grow your mailing list. If you've enjoyed the show, please consider leaving us a review on iTunes. We'll see you next time.